Welcome, everyone. It's so great to see you all here, even though it's cold and, you know, less disgusting, but still disgusting enough that I compliment you all on coming out tonight. Uh, my job is to introduce Louis Sagun, and it's my distinct pleasure to do so. Um, it's a little hissy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Lillian. <laughs> Okay, so Luis was born in Guadalajara, uh, Mexico, in 1982. His drawings, sculptures, paintings, and performances confront the palpable inescapability of race and transform art into an act of reclamation. As a previously undocumented immigrant and former laborer, Sagun's work focuses on the importance of Latinx cultures and contributions in order to combat the anti-immigration and anti-Latinx national rhetoric that persists throughout the country. We brought him here as one of our two uh, artists in residence in critical race studies, uh, and he's here for this year teaching and uh, preparing for a major exhibition that will be in the spring in the MSU Union Art Gallery. Luis earned his BFA in industrial design from Southern Illinois University and his MFA in painting from Northern Illinois University. He has participated in multiple solo juried invitational and national exhibits in the US and in Mexico. In addition to being featured in new American paintings, Luis's work has also been showcased at Expo or the International Exposition of Contemporary Art in Chicago, the Anderson Museum of Contemporary Art in Roswell, New Mexico, uh, that's the place with the aliens, the Chicago Cultural Center, not the actual Anderson, but you know, Roswell, and the National Museum of Mexican Art in Chicago. He has worked as an artist guide at the Museum of Contemporary Arts in Chicago and an art educator in the Art Institute of Chicago, developing a critical approach to museum collections. Uh, he, uh, th sorry, and he will actually engage with this as part of his exhibition uh, in this spring. Support for this lecture is provided principally by the MSU Federal Credit Union, which underwrites the artist residency, and which is, as we all know and should value, the, one of the largest patrons for the arts in our uh, community. It is also sponsored by the Broad Art Museum, the College of Arts and Letters, and our own Department of Art, Art History and Design. And without further ado, let us welcome Luis Sagun. Hello. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah? Awesome. Um, thank you so much for coming out here today. Uh, there are a lot of you here, and I'm super grateful uh, that you all came out in the cold uh, to listen to me speak, so thank you so much. I will also note that I am a little nervous, so it's like throwing it out in the universe so you all know so I could calm down a little bit. Um, but I do just want to say thank you um, to Karin and the administration and the residency program has been such a gift um, to be able to be here at Michigan State and participate, teach with my students and work on my current research. It really is a, a gift and an honor to be here, so thank you. I did want to take a moment um, to kind of reflect on where we're at today. Um, I want to read the land acknowledgement. Uh, the reason I put it up here as well is because uh, normally I cannot pronounce the name of the tribes really well, so I wanted to do honor and have it written here so that we could all see it and read it. So I'll go ahead and read that for just a second. We collectively acknowledge that Michigan State University occupies the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabe. Three fires, Confederacy of Obi Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi people. In particular, the university resides on land ceded in the 1819 Treaty of Saginaw. We recognize, support, and advocate for the sovereignty of Michigan's 12 federally recognized Indian nations, for historic indigenous communities in Michigan, for indigenous individuals and communities who live here now, and for those who were forcibly removed from their homelands. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm 
indigenous sovereignty, and we will work to hold Michigan State University more accountable to the needs of American Indians and indigenous people. Um, also want to just note that we're not that far from Thanksgiving, it's around the corner, and as we are with our families, just to think about what that holiday means, right? Um, genocide of so many people, but actually the survival of plenty. Um, so please keep that in mind. As Karin mentioned, I, I work as a teaching artist and a practicing artist. And one of the, the ways that I always like to talk about art is in a way to kind of reflect on the basics. And usually I always ask people, like, what is contemporary art? Um, and most often times, especially like little ones, we don't really know what that is, or, but we could guess, right? Um, and ultimately, contemporary art is the art of our times, is the art that's being done now. And so how I always tell my students is that if, if art, contemporary art is what's being done now in our times, then in a way, because we are alive today, we become experts in contemporary art. Um, and it's not about being right or wrong, um, but it's about having the agency to be, able to, to be able to be open to interpretation and to talk about contemporary art. Another thing that I like to talk about in contemporary art is that, in my opinion, contemporary art does three things, or, or I, in my own work, try to do three things. One is that contemporary art is for our eyes, right? So it's like, how does an object, what does it look like? The other is, um, what does it make us think? And the third is, what does it make us feel? Um, so I want to start off with this image here of a contemporary art piece. Um, so if we were to kind of analyze it a little bit, so what, you know, what do we see? What do I see? Well, it's for our eyes. So it looks like it's a canvas. It looks like it's pre-bought, like a Blick or an uh, art star. Um, it seems like there's a grid. There's um, stick figures. Looks like maybe a kid maybe made it, maybe not. Um, especially in contemporary art, right? You can never know sometimes. Um, <laughs> it makes me think, though, you know, because I do have an MFA, I've been trained academically. It makes me think of, like, Agnes Martin a little bit because she uses grid and, you know, maybe we could talk about, like, the, the way of organizing paint in, in a canvas. Um, but Agnes Martin once said, I can't remember where I read it, but she said that um, when she had envisioned innocence, in her mind, the grid came up. So she has these very beautiful paintings of grids of, of innocence. Um, not sure if I agree, but I'm not here to contest that. I just think it's a good observation. Um, so this, this drawing or painting here is done by a 10-year-old child that was recently released from Custom Border Patrol after being locked up in a cage. In my own journey of trying to figure out who I am and where I come from, I came upon this book that's titled uh, The Labyrinth of Solitude by Octavio Paz. Now, the book itself is a little dated. It was written in 1950. Um, but when I read it, it really gave me a lot of peace. And in the first chapter, he talks about this idea of uh, a Mexican coming to the United States and not fitting in, right? So you don't belong. You aren't American because you're not from here. But then you're also not Mexican because you don't connect for whatever reason. So you don't belong anywhere, right? Um, and so, in history, what has happened is a lot of, generally speaking, a lot of people that don't really kind of belong to those cultures, um, sort of like the development of like what he calls the pachucos. Some of you maybe have done some history on like the zoot suits, uh, the cholos, gangbangers. So the idea that Octavio Paz brings up is that um, by not belonging in the United States and not belonging in Mexico, you sort of start to create this other culture um, that he calls cultural suicide. He thinks of it as a dead end. Um, now in 2019, I don't think of it as a dead end. I think of it as cultural reclamation, as having the power and the agency 
to say, you know what, like, maybe I'm not Mexican, maybe I'm not American, maybe I don't want to be either, maybe I'm both, or maybe I could be a shapeshifter, and I could be whatever I want, whenever I want, right? So who am I then, right? So my name is Luis Alvaro Sagún Nuño de Sotelo, hijo de José y María, nieto de Guadalupe, Rosario y Gloria. I come from a place formerly or traditionally referred to as nothing, but that nothing has always been my everything, and it is at the core of who I am as a person, as an educator, and as an artist. Um, In an essay by Tara Yasso, she's a critical race theorist, she talks about the idea of having outsider knowledge. What does it mean to grow up in the hood, to gangbang, to be pushed out to the margins, to fight society in that way? Um, She calls that having cultural capital or cultural wealth. And that wealth is essential for spaces like this in academia and other parts of the world where voices of students and people of color are not being heard. (laughs) That's me. So on the left, I'm there with my grandma. And uh, this is right when my parents had brought me to the United States. And this is in a south suburb of Chicago called Chicago Heights. On the right is me when I was 10 years old. My favorite dinosaur was the Triceratops, I guess. Um, And as you can see, the American flag at the top right. Um, I love this picture because I think that's He-Man. I'm pretty sure it's He-Man. And when I was a little kid, I loved He-Man. Because who does that? Well, it's a little little hyper-masculine. But um, what I loved about it was that He-Man was this white person then when he became brown, he became awesome, right? And I didn't have a lot of role models back then, so I was like, yes, I need some more of that. Let's get some of that. So um, I've always been a big He-Man fan. I still have a collection of his work. This is my mom and me. <laughs> I just want to take a moment to send a shout out to my mom. She really is my hero. Um, I, a lot, in my work, I talk a lot about the men in my family and, and the last names that come from my family. Um, but I want to make sure to bring visibility because I come from a line of very strong women. So not only was my father in the fields and in the steel industry working, so was my mother. And she also came home and had a clean house and food and gave me unconditional love. A little bit back to Chicago Heights. So this image here is, uh, the green part is the cover of The Labyrinth of Solitude, the book that I mentioned, with the cage drawing of the child that drew that. And then I superimposed an aerial view of where I grew up, which is this trailer park right in the corner of State Street and Lincoln Highway. And Chicago Heights is known for a few different things. One, um, it's known for having a lot of Italian mafia. Uh, Al Capone and, and the Southside gang um, was their home, and during Prohibition, they used to have tunnels, and it used to be their main operations. So I already have a little bit of a violent history. Um, another thing that it's known for, at least for me, um, around the 1990s and early 2000, um, 
if you we think about the city of Chicago, so this is Chicago and here's uh, Chicago Heights. In the city of Chicago, there were these projects called Caprini Greens. I don't know if you've heard of them, they've become pretty famous. So Caprini Green uh, were created by Chicago Housing Authority. Um, and Caprini Green, I don't know if y'all seen the movie Candyman. Um, it's really famous. Um, so um, during the 90s and the 2000s, they started removing people from these places, pushing people out of their homes. Chicago Housing Authority did. They're displacing them, they're gentrifying. Um, and what happened was a lot of the people ended up moving to the south suburbs and different suburbs of Chicago. And in Chicago Heights, that caused a huge gang war. Um, I call it a race war because gangs, at least in the south side of Chicago, are very segregated and they're affiliated by neighborhood and by race. Um, and I grew up around that time, and around that time, I lost some of my friends due to gun and gang violence, which is where part of some of the work that I'm going to be talking about honors them and who they are. This is Jose Morales. So when I was um, back in Chicago Heights in the trailer parks, there used to be like lakes in the back and cornfields, and I used to, um, you know, growing up with my mom, and I was undocumented, so I was afraid, right? I couldn't go to the police for anything. If I ever got lost at the store, you couldn't, you know, you need to learn how to survive. You need to be quiet and be under the radar. And so when I was a little kid, I used to always go in the backyard and I used to play, and I created this game called Follow Me to America. And I was like the oldest of like three or four little kids in their neighborhood. So I would come up with this game, and we would be in the backyard, and I'd be like, come on, y'all, follow me. And we'd be like crossing the border, you know. Um, and it was like my own, imagine this little kid is like me manifesting this trauma, but still being able to play and to have fun, right? And I think play and fun um, and games is also rooted in my work. And so this piece here is called Jose Morales. And Jose Morales is, in a way, follow me to America because um, when we lived in Chicago Heights, a lot of my mother's family came to live with us. Um, and it's made out of 2,055 beads. And if you come from this side all the way to the top, it's an aerial view of the map from Guadalajara to um, Chicago Heights. And it's 2,055 miles away. So Jose Morales is a, um, oh, this fictation, he's a, he's a fictitious character. He's not real, he's an alias. Um, so in order to work here in the United States, you need a green card, right? If you're undocumented, you can't work. So um, we would go out to somewhere in the city and we would sort of hustle and like, learn this new language to be able to, to buy this green card. And so the green card, we came up with the name Jose Morales. And so this card was used by three cousins and two uncles. And so this is a series of paintings where I'm taking their faces and I'm reconfiguring them to create like what would Jose Morales look like. Um, at the same time, thinking about all the labor that um, my family came to the United States to make, all the taxes that they paid, um, they would at least have two jobs, if not three. Um, and so just also thinking about like the body and its various manifestations in that way and the labor involved with it. I see my body as the architecture of my ancestors. And so thinking about, it's been 500 years since the conquest of the Europeans coming uh, to what now is called Mexico. And um, along they destroyed my, you know, they, they killed my ancestors. And at that same time, they, they killed any spirituality that connected me to them. And so when it comes down to finding my own lineage, so I am a mestizo, which is Mexican. I am Spanish, and I am also part indigenous. And my Spanish is super easy to track. Um, I've learned that it comes from this name, from this Franciscan, Bernardino de Sagún, who wrote the Florentine Codex. Um, it's not very easy, but it's a lot easier to find where that part of my side of the family comes from. When it comes to my indigenous side, I have nothing other than my body, my family, and stories. And so I connect with my family by asking them to tell me stories, by looking at pictures, if they are any, and also by meditating, recording my, 
by measurements of my body and different body parts. So this is a requiem for mirrored ancestor. And so I'm using the same technique as Jose Morales, but using different components of different parts of my family to try to envision, but more importantly, connect with my ancestors through the act of making. This one's called Ceremonia Indefinida. Um, this, is, this was at the DePaul Art Museum for a show called New Age, New Age Strategies for Success. Super excited because it was my first time showing with Bob Ross. Y'all know who Bob Ross is, right? Yeah, so apparently he's never been in a museum exhibition, and we were in one together, so it's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> a lot of what I do in my work is I think about uh, my audience, and usually I'm very selfish. Like, when I think of my audience, like, I'm the audience or my family, um, and then um, it, it extends. But I also think of, like, you know, if I was to talk to little kids um, about my work, what would I talk to them about? And so this is a drawing that I did in, like, 2011, I think, um, where I, I, I drew my cousin uh, with his armor, and then I brought it with me here at Michigan, and I started using the beadworks to connect and to create different types of abstraction. And then in my research, I found this uh, painting of Hernán Cortés, which used to be at the White House. Um, and then they put it in, it's not at the White House anymore, but when it was at the White House, it was during the USA-Mexican War, and all of the military troops um, it was said that they would, they, they would all call themselves the new conquistadors, right? And so it was sort of this kind of vicious, um, violent way of looking at what it was to be Mexican and wanting to take their land. So I don't know, when I, when I look at work like this, it's like, so in a way, like, what am I trying to do? You know, when, with little kids, there's a lot of points of entry that you could talk about, right? So it's realism. Um, it's also armor. There's a lot of room for metaphors, a lot of room for symbol. Um, but there, you could get to the core of deeper things like power and what does power look like um, all through just visual context, right? And so this is why I like to work in this way. Like, how can art be a tool to engage into critical discussions? This is a series of work that I did. Um, I used to go into different communities and collect cardboard. Then I would stack them up together. And um, growing up, uh, I used to be a laborer and I used to work in construction. So I wanted to find, find a way to create a mark that was mine, that was, I guess, original, although I don't really like that word anymore, but the idea of like having something be mine and where does it come from, from the inside into the outside. So I did this, this series of work called Cardboard Paintings. I put this image down here so you could kind of, I would see them as like torsos and bodies of trauma and cutting and um, scar tissue. This is an exhibition I had a few years ago. It's called Luis Agun Brotherhood, Leyendas y un Bracero. So the reason why my family came to Chicago Heights was because of the steel industry. And so Bracero is a project where um, the United States would send, during World War I and World War II, would send buses to Mexico and different parts of Mexico. And they would just open the door of the bus and whoever came in was welcome into the bus and they would drive you to different parts of the United States so that you could work while the troops here were at war. Um, and so my grandfather and my, um, both my maternal and paternal families um, ended up in Chicago Heights working in steel. Um, so when they came to the United States, it just seemed like the logical place to go was Chicago Heights. Now, Leyendas y un Bracero are legends of a laborer. Um, I also, remember I said that for me, sorry, it keeps moving. I'm a little selfish with my audience. So I wanted to see if I could use art as a way to connect to my family, most, mostly my mom and dad. Um, there was a disconnect there, and I noticed that in our house, um, they had different types of paintings and objects, like 
goldfish and all these like little trinkets that were really weird. And so I created all the work, all of those little trinkets, I turned it into a mythology um, that celebrated the stories of my friends who had passed away. Um, and so this is sort of like a panther cat kind of thing. Oh, hold on, give me one second. I have really tiny ears with really big, uh, what is this thing called? Earlobe. <laughs> Don't judge me. Okay. Uh, this is when I was in Roswell with the aliens hanging out. Um, I, you know, it's my seem a little corny, but for me, I was, I was making work and I, I was kind of fed up of thinking about um, who my audience was. And I just said, you know, like, what if I made a sculpture that I could dedicate it to the moon? that was for something bigger than us. Um, and so I just started making this sculpture with the mythology story in the middle of the chest using drywall, wood, uh, OSB, resin, spray paint, um, oil, acrylic. This is a painting titled A Goodbye Kiss. When I was little, my grandma couldn't really visit us in the United States. Um, one of the last times I saw her, she said that she, whenever she would die, that she would come say goodbye to me in my dreams. And one day when I was in southern Illinois, I had this dream that she came to me and she gave me a kiss and I gave her a hug and we said goodbye. And I swear, as soon as I woke up, the phone rang and it was my sister and I already knew what had happened. So this painting was dedicated for her. Miniature sculptures made out of concrete. More recently, I had an exhibition titled The Mountains Whispered and the Canyon Sang. I'm just going to show a little video of that. I think the sound should be okay. We'll see. Can I hear it? Mm -hmm. Well, it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no singing. Oh, but I worked with a vocalist. His name is Matt Woods, so shout out to him. And I worked with Semantico's Dance Company to come up with lyrics um, and dance and choreography to, that celebrated the mythologies that I had created that were devoted to my friends. Y'all can't hear it, right? All right, let's just move on. This is one of the masks that I created for the exhibition. Sombras de nuestro ayer, shadows of our yesterday. Hasta la raíz, up to the root, I believe. So this is super interesting. I, um, you know, sometimes I do talks to high schools and I go back to where like, the hoods where I grew up in, and I used to tell my students or the, the high school students that it was a miracle I made it out, right? Like, if anybody that knew me, um, like, I just wasn't good at school, I, you know, and, and so I would all say it was a miracle, but I started shifting that idea or that way of thinking, and I started thinking that it wasn't a miracle, that it was, like, meant to be. Um, and so a couple of years ago, I was invited to teach a program in collaboration, collaboration with the Smart Museum of Art, um, and Chicago Housing Authority. So if you remember, Chicago Housing Authority were the public housing in Chicago that removed the people that came into my neighborhoods that created all the trauma that I've been facing. Um, it, I thought about it long and hard, but I realized that it was a great opportunity to be a part of a solution or to at least do something and shift the energy. So I accepted the position and I I work with these amazing, amazing, amazing students from the south side and west side of Chicago. We meet at the museum in the summer. Um, they're non-art majors. Uh, we create this ritual where um, every day we meet at the exact same time. We, it's called Pass the Squeeze. It's used in theater a lot. 
So we, sit, we, we get into a circle and we pass a squeeze of the intention of the day. It's a way to honor ourselves. We do emotional check-ins. Um, and there's a video, but maybe we don't need the sound. Let's see. Yeah, I just really love my students. They're amazing. Um, so together, we, I was able to work with them for two years. The first year is more of a pilot program. Um, so we went all over the city of Chicago. We did different types of maps, a lot of different di activities. Um, and the, the first program was so successful that they were able to turn it into a five-year program. And during the first year, we curated a show together called Together We Can Dream. Um, and it's all student-led. Um, and we used the collections of the Smart Museum to create the exhibition. We did workshops to teach the teens how to talk about art through their own lived experiences to connect with other teenagers. We did uh, neighborhood tours all over the city of Chicago. We worked with other artists in creating murals. <laughs> Went to the Southside Art Center. And um, after the first year, they, uh, the Smart Museum was able to get this chalet, which is the building in the back. Um, and for the next five years, the teens are going to create the, the chalet into their own vision. It's going to be a community center for students by students. So this is us in the CTA traveling, going to different uh, museums and different spaces to learn about the artwork to think about what are things that unite us and don't separate us. So if we go to the Mexican Museum of Fine Arts, asking the tough questions of like, why should this matter? Why should we care? And having those communications and those dialogues. <laughs> Doing wood, woodworking, woodshops, uh, printmaking, poetry. Uh, we went to urban farming. Shout out to Emmanuel Pratt. He was just given the MacArthur Genius Award. Um, also celebrating other voices, other teens in the community, building sculptures together, having visiting artists, Victoria Martinez, to talk about the African presence in Mexico. Oh, the sound isn't good. Oh, I had another video. So um, this is a sculpture that I created, Pain is Our North Star. I was invited at the Museum of Contemporary Art to um, workshop a performance, so it was not very unsimilar to this. We would have a, a sculpture here, and then I worked with the Folkloric Dance Company um, and a contemporary dance company to come up with a ritual uh, for one of my friends that had passed away. So the idea is that the, there was an audience that got to see the behind the scenes of how do you create those workshops, what are the conversations being had. I love using beads in my work, and all the materials that I use come from uh, construction sites or thinking of like how the, the materials that I used to work with when I was using construction. So thinking of points of entry as well. Like for me, like a bead, right, it, it's also sort of like a shapeshifter, right? It's, it's a color, it's a shape, it's a void, right? When you put it together, it could serve as a chain. I just find it really beautiful to use something traditional in a contemporary way and having those two conversations exist. Here are some of the pictures from the performance at the museum. And this one I do sing. Not very well. 
Um, <laughs> we'll see if it plays. They're adorable. So we had conversations about, you know, normally like in today, you know, I, I talk and then y'all ask me some questions, but I wanted to reverse that. So we did a reverse Q&A. So we would pause it and we would have like this beautiful dancer, right? And then we would ask questions like, um, so everyone's excited that this is an awesome dance, but like where else have you seen this type of dancing before? And that would lead us to having conversations of, about like not using this for Halloween and like how in different areas, depending on where you are in the city or in the country, um, th there's a hierarchy even in dance. And so contemporary dance is seen as something super elevated when folkloric dancing isn't. Um, and so just to be able to see all the dancers being like little kids and then contemporary dancers being more adult, to see that generation is really beautiful. I think this is where the sound is. So um, the first voice of that sound was my mom. She has this song that she sings all the time that's passed down through generations. And the song really is about teaching the little kids how to wash your hands and how to brush your teeth and all these little everyday things that we take for granted. And then I interject and I start singing, and very badly, but I uh, start singing and switching the lyrics of saying a final goodbye to my friend basically saying that you didn't get the opportunity to learn these things or to really live a life because it was taken from you because of those gun and gang violence in the community. Um, his name is Daniel Moreno. And in, I think it was November 17th, 2007, I believe, um, he uh, lost his life to gun violence. So I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about what I, do at, what I did at the MCA. Um, I work with K-12 students uh, with Chicago Public Schools, and they come and hang out with me for an hour, and we talk about art, and then we make art. And um, for me, it's really important that when we're hanging out together, that it's a very meaningful time. So a lot of the things we talk about is like, how can you use this thing called art to tr make ourselves move from feeling invisible to feeling invincible? Um, so I will lead the students through conversations in art, and I would ask them questions like, when is the last time you felt invisible? Um, they would share. Sometimes they will, sometimes they won't share. And then we talk about the ideas of how you could actually use the act of making for you to be able to control that feeling. Um, and so this is, uh, <laughs> we created these uh, chameleon suits, right? So we talked about agency whether we want to stand out or do we want to blend in. And the important thing is, is that we get to decide. So in a museum that was not really intended for people of color, what does it mean to go into these spaces and take up space and be unapologetically loud, right, at this age? And a lot of the times when 
these students come, they come from um, K through 12 system where there's a lot of rules. So we talk about like what does it mean to have these rules? How can we break those rules? And then we connect them with the rules of society. <laughs> so it's being loud, we'll have like impromptu parades, we dance, we make up games, not, un not unsimilar to uh, Follow Me to America, right? Like it's a chance to play, to connect, and to experience art together. This piece was one of my favorite, <laughs> well, I guess I shouldn't say favorite. It was just, it really stood out to me when I worked with these students. Um, when they came into the museum, the teacher started separating them by, by gender. And I thought that was really weird. And I was like, no, don't do that. And, and so the teacher was really mean. And, and first of all, shout out to Chicago Public Schools and all teachers, right? It's a really difficult job. And <laughs> Um, but for me and the museum, it, it's an opportunity to kind of have fun and break with those rules. And so they were really upset. And we started to talk about why they were upset. And we started to talk about the rules of always having, you know, like people telling us what to do, what not to do. Um, and so I was like, you want to know a secret? Like, artists make work about that. Like, we hate the fucking rules. And then they're like, why? Like, yeah. And then so we go to see Ule and Anna Abramovic right, to scream, to get all of this out. And then, so I made him a promise that we would be able to yell and scream and rant together. Um, so after seeing that piece, we walk down and we see a Felix Gonzalez Torres, which is called Untitled The End, which is about, there's a pieces of paper that stack up to weigh the same amount of Ross, his partner, who died from the AIDS crisis. Um, so the idea is that it's a sheet of paper that you take with you, that you continue the story so we connect the idea of anger um, and expression with shifting it to be able to tell our own stories so that we don't have to conform to the rules. We're just yelling. That is all. Thank you so much for coming and for listening to my talk. Um, if I could say something. What? I just want to open um, the floor, invisible floor, that if, instead of thinking of like, if, do you have any questions? Like maybe are you curious or are you wondering about something that I said today? I know that for me, asking questions usually kind of shuts the door at me. So if there's any opportunity for you all to think about something that you're curious about, you want to learn, or something that I didn't address, um, feel free to go ahead and um, let me know. <laughs> Impromptu performance. Is it? Okay. Um, so I kind of noticed, like, when you, before you took the hoodie off, you stopped and, like, started stacking. Um, do you know anybody or were you possibly affiliated in gangs to, like, know that? Yeah, so the question was that in my performance I did stacking, which is when you take different gang signs and you stack them together. Um, when I was growing up, we just sort of called it gangbanging. At least I didn't really know the term. Um, and I thought, I thought a lot about whether I should do that or not today, um, out of trauma and out of fear. But I think if I was going to come up here today and talk about reclaiming power, then maybe it's a good opportunity to do it here with all of you. Uh, so yeah, I used to gangbang and, um, at various degrees when I was younger. Um, so I wanted to reclaim that and not glorify it, but say, you know what, that's part of my life. That is the part of the history, that, uh, how I see the world, and it's okay. And like now I use that as a as way to shift power and to connect with people. Because when, when you grow up in the hood like that, you learn to survive. You could, you could, I was the kind of kid that you could go gangbang, then I could go play soccer, and then I could go play video games, and I was doing all these different things. And so there's all these stereotypes connected to people that gangbang that they're evil and they're not, right? 
it's a way to survive. And that tool that we learned from the hood, we could carry that everywhere in academia, in navigating these spaces, right, and having value in ourselves. Um, so that's why I did it. Gonna stay right here. Hi. Um, I know you mentioned before that you were originally undocumented, um, but you know, I guess you you weren't a documented um, American citizen. But what prompted you to obtain American citizenship? You know, after all this time, and what was the process of becoming an American citizen, like through like the visa and all that stuff? Mm -hmm. Can you do me a favor? Oh, I see you. I can see you. I, awesome. So the question is, um, I was undocumented. I mentioned that. And then how did I get papers? So I was really lucky that when I had only been here for a few years, um, Ronald Reagan did an amnesty act, I believe, and that if you, you basically would go to the government and said, like, yeah, we, we came to this country, um, undocumented. Um, this is how we did it. Um, but look at what we've been doing, how we've been contributing. There was this whole process. Um, and then they would decide whether they would either deport you or give you uh, papers. Um, and so that sounds easy, but it was very difficult. I still remember in our communities, you don't trust anyone. You don't trust the police or lawyers. So we didn't know if it was a scam to figure out who we were so that they could get us out of this country. Um, but our parents um, had a good community that they, they really believed in, and we thought that that was, well, they thought that was the right thing to do, and it ended up paying off for us. So I was lucky in that way, and there's millions of people that aren't, so. Yeah, thank you. So this is the second time that I've looked at these masks and I just wonder if you could talk about masking um, as an artistic strategy, what, what has been your inspiration um, visually and in performing, yeah. I guess. And, yeah. Thank you. So the question is, uh, my masks, what has been the inspiration to create them? That's a really great question. I think there was a moment when I realized that I'm traditionally trained as a painter, did hyperrealism for a long time. And um, I wanted to make artwork that felt more alive, that had a heartbeat. And um, I fell in love with the idea of mask. And in the Labyrinth of Solitude, there's actually a chapter as well of like what it means to wear that, an invisible mask. I feel like we all mask our pain and our traumas. So for me, it was a way to blend in and blend out. It was a way to to connect and activate my performances. Um, but my masks are also very, they're wearable, but they're very tough. Like I have a mask that I'm making in Kresge and it's, it has to be about like 50 pounds now. It's like, so it's like all these, they're not very practical. And that's the idea that, that it, it also provides a platform for us to, to feel safe, but they could also be hurtful in some way. And so like these crazy masks that don't really function as a mask and then you could hardly see through them, so you also become the sculpture. It's not very clear that it's a mask, so I'm interested in blurring those little lines. Um, but in the future, I think I'm gonna make actual wearable masks, so. Oh, hurt my back so much. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you for your talk. Um, something that I was a little bit curious about is growing up in Chicago, were there artists that you were seeing that sort of served as catalysts for some of the work that you make? And I say that because um, when you're working with like the mask or some of the more performative pieces and then seeing a Nick Cave in one of your images, if he was somebody that you had a chance to see and that inspired you or influenced you. Mm -hmm. So the question is if any Chicago artists had influenced me while I was growing up or just being in the city. Um, I mean, Chicago has such a vibrant community of artists that 
I feel very much a part of and they all inspire me in some way. Um, Niv Cave, when I first started making artwork, undoubtedly, you know, I connected because it, he does amazing work. Um, but I don't think that that really influenced why I would make uh, wearable art in that sense. I love his work. I love what, what he and his partner does, an incredible artist. Um, but for me, I'm rooted more in like these indigenous pasts. So not on, not very, not like Nick at all. I don't want to speak for him, but thinking a lot about um, my artwork has led me to people who who do like Santeria or study in the Yoruba or West African traditions. And also thinking about when I've, I did a residency in Oaxaca where I learned and um, to make alebrijes and with folk artists there. So I think that was a deeper, more rooted connection that I had in working with those mythologies and those ways of stories and dance as a way to keep telling a story that isn't, um, that is a little bit different, I guess. So, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for your talk um, and for sharing so much of the process. It helps also just to, <clears throat> I mean, your work is wonderful in first glance, but to have that kind of depth is such a gift. Um, and I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit of what we have to look forward to in March um, and some of the process that's going into that. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. So our uh, show opens, I believe it's March 27th, right? <laughs> um, yeah, we're really excited. I think one of my collaborators is here, Amina. She, um, right over there, hi. So, <laughs> and we're working with the, the Broad Museum. Um, the Broad Museum, <laughs> we're in it. <laughs> so there. Uh, <laughs> it just feels weird in this space, I guess it's over there. Um, so we're going to, Oh, if, I don't know if this will be too much. I showed a lot of images. Okay. All right. <laughs> it's like my mom's going to be so upset at me. She's like, why'd you show that picture? She was so tired that day. She had gone off work, and I had like, trained and rehearsed at school every day we we're doing this play it was this dance and i was like it was at home and she was sleeping i was like mom today's the play like we gotta go she's like no nah, we don't have to i was like yeah i've been working really hard and and the play and the dance is from the dance of los arrieros which the arrieros my my great grandfather was an arriero and they were tradesmen um and now there's this folkloric dance which i did when i was little and the idea is to celebrate the trading that was happening in the Americas. And so with Amina and I, we're going to collaborate to create a new version, a 2019 version that's more inclusive with gender, with race and dance movements to reenact the Arriero dance um, as a trade to some of the artifacts that the Broad and the MSU Museum, if they want to work with me, um, to bring that together. So there's going to be masks, uh, paintings, performances, and sounds involved. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful talk. That was uh, really delightful, and I learned a lot about your work from it. Um, I was curious about the role of gender in your work, um, because uh, you have this process that involves a lot of accumulation and using forms of uh, sort of crafting things together in ways that have in at least the feminist tradition of, you know, if you think of back to seven, uh, second wave feminism, at least um, there's been this tradition of using, uh, you know, beads or handiwork um, and a lot of accumulation um, in order to honor the processes of making that have traditionally been associated with women. Um, things like, you know, embroidering, hand stitching, uh, weaving, knitting, this sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and I was just curious um, if that was something that you were thinking about in your work, and, and particularly like this conquistador's armor that you've um, mm. made out of all of these accumulations of small things um, that is, you know, highly ornamented and uh, potentially also actually disarming <laughs> in a way that's the opposite of what we imagine armor normally should do. So I feel like, you know, when we look at somebody who's wearing a lot of armor, 
it can be disarming to the person who's looking at it because they might lay down their arms because they're so intimidated by the bright shine of somebody's metal chest plate. Mm. Um, yeah. Or we can think of something as being disarming because it's um, ingratiating or it's, you know, it's pleasing or um, it's solicitous. And I feel like that was a really nice moment where we have um, an image that manages to uh, replace the sort of the shiny repulsion of <laughs> the <laughs> armor that protects uh, with um, a surface texture that um, seems like it's sort of you know more um, uh, more welcoming. Yeah. In any case, I was just curious if that history of sort of you know quote unquote feminine craft uh, was part of what you were interested in here as well. Yeah, that's a very beautiful question. Thank you. Uh, the question, if I will try to summarize it, just the, the role of maybe gender constructs or stereo, no, I wouldn't say stereo, but the role of gender in my work, I guess, would be to summarize that question. Um, yes, I do think about it um, often. Um, maybe less so now, I think in this point in my career. At first, uh, I, especially working with like two by fours and these aggressive like sawzalls and thinking of like that's very masculine, right? But is it, I mean, also in like feminism, there's a lot of women that, sh that use these types of tools and who are very aggressive. So by admitting that, then I'm admitting that women can't be aggressive or can't be strength. So like I'm always sort of like thinking of these things in my work. Um, and, and what I did today, I came in with the hood with Old English, which is sort of you think about as very masculine. Um, but then I'm wearing a woman's shirt that is traditionally rooted in, you know, um, I guess we could call it like Oaxacan tradition as well. Um, so I think now that I'm, I'm learning to take more ownership of just like not thinking about gender in that way, but just trying to be fluid and to be honest with my work. Um, but in the beginning I was really thinking, because it was important for me that the work didn't come off as masculine. Um, it, I wanted to, to shift both back and forth and be able to have both of those moments again of thinking like, when can I, can this moment or this gesture be masculine or can this be feminine? Um, so yeah, did I answer your question? Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Is this off? Oh, I mean, speak <laughs> now. All right. Are you sure? <laughs> All right. In that case, let's just thank Luis. Thank you.